Hey, thank you all for coming. Um, you will notice that I am not Tom Farden. Um, Tom Farden is, I probably assume, cycling someone. He asked me to cover his impatient duties, and I realise I'm also covering this. Um, usually he passes some witty comment um, about Drew. I, I don't think there's anything funny to say about Drew, so we'll pass on that. Drew is going to talk to us about the electronic patient record and also more exciting things that are coming soon. Soon. Without further ado, Drew. Yep. Drew, um, just one thing. If PI comes, that will go off. Yeah. What you have to do is press PC and okay. come back on. Right here. Okay. And you are being recorded. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about paper switch off, but as part of that, I thought I would give a, a background to the developments which are going to be happening over the coming couple of years with the electronic patient records. Um, I have a role in terms of being involved with the electronic patient record and having a session of my time a week to, to help give a clinical perspective on that. I got that role because I wrote lots of emails when I arrived back from abroad and um, I think I peed people off enough that they actually invited me to come in and join them. So I was going to talk a little bit about the current status, the future direction and also some of our current developments because things are not... Um, at a standstill at the moment. There are things still happening and new developments which are coming along. I think when you look at NHS Tayside, um, when I left to go to New Zealand in 2007, it was a fairly um, it light environment rather than paper light environment um, in that we had central vision to collect, um, look at blood results. Uh, we had packs for the radiologists but not for the clinicians. And we only had some single specialty systems really in the, the main IT armoury. I moved to a small place called Hawke's Bay, which is um, more renowned for its wine than its IT systems. But when I arrived, I was amazed to see that there was a PAS link to the clinical portal, um, which had ward and clinician lists. You could sign off lab results electronically. Um, you could jump directly from, pic um, from the portal report of an X-ray directly into the film of that X-ray. The emergency department was linked to the portal. You could see clinic letters, and you only really used paper for the inpatients and the rest of it was electronic. When I arrived back, there's quite a big change in NHS Tayside in that um, ICE was just on its way and the Reno unit was one of the test environments for ICE at that stage. There was packs for all, the clinical portal had come along and was starting to um, enrich our electronic data. There was RMS, EDD, there's the MIDAS system, which is the community system had started. Um, we had the, the emergency care summary and digital dictation. So the, the playing field had changed quite a lot over four years, and I think it's continued to change since then. So at the moment, we have lots of different systems that we're using to look after our patients. Um, we have lots and lots of paper still, and this is really a major challenge going forward. The paper records are undervalued and they're um, difficult to interpret after the event. When you go back to look at a complaint, for example, um, that one um, cardex that you want to find for the drugs or the blood pressure chart the day the patient crashed, you can't find that because it's undervalued and it's stuffed in the back of the, the notes and you can't find those key bits of information. We have very good general practice electronic patient records, and the GPs are um, years ahead of secondary care in terms of how they, they run their business and how they um, get quality data of clinical quality data rather than organisational quality data out of their records. Um, we have the portal, and around the portal, obviously, there's the document store coming into that. We have information from Topaz feeding into that, RMS feeding into that, some of the ICE and PACS information. Um, the emergency care summary now feeds into that. So if you have a, an ECS account, you can see um, all their drug prescribing from um, primary care, and you can also see any anticipated care plans and key information summaries they might have. And we have EDD. We also use ward view on the wards to try and um, improve our um, multidisciplinary working. There's a system called Edison, which is used to um, chivy the um, social work departments along when we've got delayed discharges. There's a the community system, Midas, and then we have lots of single specialty accounts still. So we have, um, in Reno, we have a nephrology system, which we use for most of our patient records. And it talks to some extent to portal, but, or will talk to some extent to portal in the near future. But we've got lots of silo systems, which are sitting uh, with lots of rich data in them, which can't be accessed by all. Sky diabetes is a classic, another example of that. 
In terms of Porto, when we look at what Porto now has, it has a huge amount of information. And if you're doing a clinic and you don't have the patient's case record, you can gain most of what you need from Porto. So the paper is we're less reliant on the paper record than we used to be. So we've got ECS, ACP. Um, Dougie Elder has done a sterling job pulling in cardiology data and pulmonary function tests into Porto. We've got the document still with all the letters. We've got the old results, which um, for nephrologists is interesting, but for most people we've probably never looked at. Um, one of the things which is unique in Scotland is that we have a GP core data set within our clinical portal. Nowhere else has that at the moment. And, you know, we pull in blood pressures, their coded history of some of their clinical codes, um, their allergies, um, if they're coded correctly in general practice, their recent blood pressure measurements and their smoking status and things. So that's really useful data to, you, to have at your fingertips if you're looking at a patient. We also have some of ICE, Topaz, Vascular Lab, um, the referral management system, the Warfarin Monitor, if you've got access to that. And we also have out-of-hours contacts, which is really useful, actually, if you've been phoning, if you've seen a patient in clinic and then they're coming back and they've had 10 out-of-hours appointments in between times, it's important to know what's been going on. And we're now actually feeding data out of clinical portal into primary care with the outpatient communication script. And I'll talk a wee bit about that later. In 2012, we had lots of results which are still only on paper, and we're managing to knock that down so that there's less results just available on paper and more available via the clinical portal. But we still are relying on paper case notes. Um, the inpatient medical notes are still paper-based. The nursing notes are still patient-based, uh, paper-based. The um, allied health professional notes are paper-based, and they're often in silos. So the dietitians will walk around with folders with lots of sets of um, notes about patients, which we don't have access to as clinicians otherwise, similarly in some of the other AHP specialties. And in outpatients, we have handwritten notes, which are meant to be the, the record summary of our visit to, with that patient that day. Usually mine is blank, because I've done my digitization at the time, and it really offers very little in the way of um, useful information. So where are we on our EPR journey? Um, there's various stages that you can get to as an electronic patient record. The first stage is really that you start collecting data and representing data to uh, a wider audience. And that's where we're predominantly at at the moment. So we've got Clinical Portal, which is presenting lots of data. We have PACS, which presents lots of images to us, and the Emergency Care Summary. We have the work some workflow going on in that we are ordering and um, asking for blood tests to be done and radiology tests to be done electronically now. And from the 1st of August, all CT and all MRI and cross-sectional imaging will have to be asked for using electronic systems as we're turning off the paper requesting for those types of investigations, predominantly so that we can prove the quality of the information that's being given on the form um, and also so that we know who's requesting it properly. So um, we're doing that now. And we can actually action some of those documents electronically as well. So there's been a project running, which I'll talk about, where we've been looking at filing using ICE rather than filing using paper. Um, we also do workflow with RMS in that we get presented with documents and then we decide what we're going to do with that document via the RMS system. So are we going to book them into our clinic? Are we going to offer advice to general practice um, electronically? Or are we going to send and see someone else if we don't think it's they've been sent to the right specialty. So we are doing some workflow via um, our systems, but limited. We have some real-time data entry in limited single specialty systems. So in Reno, for example, our nurses put data in, in near real-time and don't record any paper for each of their, clinic, their dialysis visits. And in clinic, we type in as we go into clinic for some of our patients. We also have some limited decision support, which is a real... Um, place that we need to get to in the long term. Sky Diabetes has some clinical decision support around um, foot care and, um, and that's one of the few bits where we're actually flagging up that we've got um, something wrong and you've got to do something about it. The key really is to move from data repositories to the decision support. Once we get to decision support, we will be at a point where we're actually starting to improve patient safety. Up until that point, we will make limited gains, but once we start interacting all the data that we collect into decision support will make significant gains. And that's what the evidence from the, the literature would tell us. Why do we need it? We need to present all our patient data in one place. 
At the moment, we're always rooting around for information. There'll be a set of case notes in Angus, there'll be a set of case notes in Perth, and there'll be a Nine Wells case note for many patients as well. And it's trying to marry that information up together. Um, if you're an anaesthetist and someone's had an operation in Angus, their um, anaesthetic chart will be in their Angus case notes. But they then present acutely to Nine Wells with a surgical abdomen and they need an urgent operation. It'd be really nice to know what was going on at their last operation. Did they have a difficult intubation or anything like that? And you don't know that because you don't have that, that case note available to you. So it allows real-time um, presentation of as much data as possible. The patients move much quicker around the system than they used to as well. Our patients used to go to one specialty and then they'd have a prolonged journey through that specialty. Now they have, we have a lot more patients with multimorbidity and we have these very strict targets for, say, cancer where it's a 32-day journey. And the notes are moving around the organisation very quickly that, so we can't always get the notes back to where they need to be to tell the next person to do something with them. It'd be great to have real-time electronic capture of structured data, not just um, handwritten switching the, the paper notes into a handwritten format. If we structure data so that we can code it, we can then interrogate that data for information later. And that's what we need to do to have clinical decision support. It needs to support multi-professional agency working across primary and secondary and the third sector. There's a, a, the Scottish Government's got a key aim at the moment, which is health and social care integration. So trying to reduce our number of hospital beds by looking at how we can care for be patients better in the community. At the moment, we all don't talk to each other. Um, secondary care's got a record, primary care's got a record. There's a little bit of interaction via clinical portal, but the third sector talks to us and faxes. So at the moment, we um, fax off referrals to social work departments. We hope that they get them. And then the nurses spend time on the phone, phoning up, asking for um, referrals to say, where is this referral in the system? And there's no way of knowing where that referral is electronically. And it will help us reduce silo working. And in the event, end, I'm hoping that we'll get to a point where we get clinical decision support. So the future of our EPO, EPR programme is really... Um, organisational change. We could plug in a computer system tomorrow um, which could do it all for us potentially. There'd be some time spent getting this um, interoperability between our systems together to make it work. But it's not the plugging in of the computer system which is the difficulty. It's getting us all to change the way that we work and moving from um, reliance on the paper systems and how we've done it for 20, 30 years I first worked in Nine Wells in 1996, and many of the processes are exactly the same now as they were 20 years ago. So, you know, in terms of results management, where consultants get piles of notes piled up on their desk with CT scans or chest X-rays, and then they go through them and dictate a letter or sign them off. So it's not about just the IT system. It has to be part of an organisational change, and that's going to be more difficult for us all to cope with than the, the change in the IT Cliff, who's sitting across there, who's one of the e-health leads, says, uh, we all learn how to use Amazon and EasyJet fairly quickly. So we could all learn how to use most of these systems. But it's actually the, the whole process of how we embrace that rather than keeping to our paper records. And the e-health programme really has to align with what the organisation wants to do rather than come up with products which it thinks is important for us. So there's been a focus now to move from e-health being a separate body but and bringing it back into um, clinical work. So each of the directorates now has an a e-health lead who um, goes to meetings and is a point of contact. So we're trying to bring e-health back in to the main body of the Kirk. So we need to move from reliance on paper systems to electronic systems. And for that, there needs to be process redesign and some process standardisation. Our junior doctors work across multiple wards. At night, they'll maybe cover seven, eight wards each of those seven or eight wards will have a different process for how they do stuff. And if we have different processes for how they do stuff, that's going to lead to errors. So we need to look at our process and look to see if we can standardise it when possible. So this takes us on to the diagnostic paper switch-off, acute rollout, the really snappy title. Um, so how did this come about? We've decided that we need to look at how we manage our lab systems and lab reports better because we've missed stuff. There's been multiple skiers which are significant clinical event analyses which have shown that 
we've messed up when we've been looking for results. We've either missed it or we've not looked at it for weeks and weeks and weeks um, and it's led to patient harm. Classic examples would be a patient coming to the renal clinic whose Bentz Jones protein um, doesn't get looked at and and has myeloma, or a patient who has a chest x-ray in a surgical ward, there's no air under the diaphragm, but they've got a cancer in the right upper lobe of their chest. And those are missed because people are looking at very specific things, uh, or the result isn't looked at at all because it's gone on paper and it's not reached the right desk. So there was a a huge concern about the the governance of our lab reports because at the moment it's a, a fairly ungoverned process. And there's also no good guidance on how we manage lab reports. Um, the GMC has a guidance which is very much, um, if you did the test, you need to look at the results. That doesn't really reflect 21st century medicine, where we work in teams and patients flow through an organisation. So if a blood test is done in ED and then the patient's moved to AMU, is it the ED doctor's responsibility to follow up that blood culture result two days later? Or is it the team who's now looking after the patient's responsibility to look after that result? So there, there needs to be better um, governance of how we do this. So we did a test of change, as we ought to do, to see if it works. And we did that test of change across various areas. We did it in Reno. We did it in the acute medicine unit outpatient clinics. Uh, we did it in the cardiology inpatient ward. And recently the bone service, have, the bone clinic, have switched off paper as well. Um, and we did it to look at the risks to the mixed paper electronic economy. We did risk workshops to look at what are the risks of us turning off paper. A lot of those risks were mitigatable. If we kept with the paper, all the risks which are there are unmitigatable because the process can't be made any better. Um, And we trialled turning it off. That turn off has worked well in those limited specialties. It has taken a significant amount of input and time to make that work. Um, but it's now at the point where it's been agreed by the associate medical directors, the, the senior management team and the information governance committee that this is a better approach to how we manage results from the point of view of patient safety and that we need to do this as an organisation. So it fits in nicely with NHS Tayside strategy for, um, the, from the records point of view, which is to reduce the quantity of paper produced and filed. We have about 200 medical record staff who run around this hospital and organisation getting notes to the right places all the time. And then we have people going up, secretaries going up and spending time um, filing stuff in case records. At the same time, we have a two to three week delay in most clinical areas of typing so that letters are not getting to general practitioners in a timely manner for clinical information. So we're using staff to do stuff which really doesn't need to be done. Um, and we could better deploy them doing other bits within the organisation. So we're moving to um, ISOM radiology and blood sciences paper requesting. We're going to turn that off, and we're going to do that over the next year. The diagnostics, um, in terms of clinical portal, the referral letters and the other letters held in clinical portal, we're not turning off paper production there yet. The reason for that is that Clinical Portal has been a little bit angsty since it had its upgrade and there's been a few bits bits and pieces of time when it's gone down. And if we didn't have the paper copies and Clinical Portal went down for the afternoon, we could all go home early because there would be no outpatient clinics because if we've not got a paper copy and we don't have access to Portal, we wouldn't be able to do our clinics. So until Portal is um, more secure and more robust and IT are working on that at the moment... Um, we're keeping on printing those bits of paper. But if we get to a point where clinical portal is robust enough, we'll be turning off those bits of paper too. It's in line with what other health boards have done. Greater Glasgow and Clyde don't file anything new now in their case notes. When a patient comes in for an inpatient stay or an outpatient episode, they get a bit of paper which has uh, which is written on and the, the inpatient file is scanned at the end of that visit and then the the paper file is destroyed and the scan file is kept on their clinical portal. So they don't produce anything new into the record. Now you're going to all say, but what happened in Greater Glasgow and Clyde two years ago? It all fell apart because they couldn't get access to anything for a couple of days. And that's because there was a glitch in um, the Windows Active Directories, not a glitch in their electronic patient record. So it's a glitch with Windows rather than anything else which prevented them from doing their job right. Um, 
NHS Lovian are moving forward even further. They're talking now about doing pre-assessment electronically and they're, they've got a plan to um, introduce electronic clerking in in the acute assessment units and then a, a electronic ward round notes from then on in. So what's the benefits of paperless reporting? It's assured, it's an auditable, auditable process for results management. I know that if I go on to a lab result and it's really abnormal and I think, well, has anyone seen it before? I can tell that from ICE. I can see who's looked at it and potentially know that something's been done about it or something's not been done about it. At the moment, if I get a bit of paper on my desk, I don't know what's happened to that. Standard operating procedures will lead to core protocols for doctors covering various areas. It will firm up what our specialist nurses do. At the moment, our specialist nurses request and they... Um, sign off results but there's no clear standard operating procedure for them the AHPs working in advanced roles, so physiotherapists for example dealing with back pain, they've actually got a really good protocol already in place, they just started requesting it not that long ago so when they started they actually built a standard operating procedure which has escalation policies for unexpected findings and what to do when they don't know what to do um, and for our admi uh, administration and clerical staff there's so many different ways of handing a piece of paper across this organisation. What's happened over the years is that rather than looking at a lean process, every time there's a cock-up in a department, they put an extra sticking plaster on, so they add an extra layer of organisation to that lab result. So, for example, in some departments, the consultant will be dictating a letter that says, I've requested an MRI, um, and the secretaries will then open up an Excel spreadsheet put down the patient CHI, they then phone MRI to ask, have you received a request for this MRI scan? They then um, wait for the MRI report to come back. They then note down the date it's come back. They give it to the consultant to review and write a letter about. They then put a date for when it's been reviewed and the letter's been written, and then they close off that bit of the file. And you can imagine, if you're in a high-volume specialty, the amount of time which is spent doing that rather than actually having a lean process is huge. So the risks at the moment of requesting are the legibility of the test. Do you give the x-ray doctors enough information on that MRI request in paper which they can read to make them do the right sequences on the MRI? Or do you get an MRI back which says um, we've done this set of sequences and then you go that's not the right set of sequences so the patient has to go back and have another MRI or the radiologist thinks well I'm not sure what they're looking for here so we'll do an extra T2 flare or whatever and they actually do more sequences and spend more time in the MRI than they need to there's transcription errors so um, if it's on paper um, they might not know who signed it and, they've, and the secretaries in the radiology department think well that looks like it might be Dr Shembury and they send back something to Stuart and Stuart looks at it and goes think about this uh, and then some, someone has to spend a significant amount of time getting it to the right person there's diagnostic efficiencies in the lab the number of um, labs um, bottles that the lab can do if it's got a barcode on it is much higher than handwritten paper uh, requests so it, there's huge efficiencies for the lab from that point point. and the other thing is if I write a CT card in clinic how do I know it's actually got to this, the x-ray department I've got no way to prove that, so it protects myself if I request electronically, because I can say it went into the department on this date. I then can know if it's been rejected or the patient doesn't attend, because there's electronic reports come out for each of those events. And we now know that we can govern the received, viewed and actioned reports. Who's viewed it and has it... And in the inpatient environment, there's a huge assumption that the reports are viewed electronically, so we don't need to look at the, the paper copies. In one ward I was in recently, um, on a Friday afternoon, there was a big stack of results. On the Monday morning, there were no results in that ward at all. And I said to the juniors, who did all the filing? Because at the weekend, no one does filing. And they, they all looked at each other blankly. And I opened up the confidential waste bin. And that pile of results had all just been into the confidential waste bin. Now, that's a, an issue because no one values the paper copies. And there might be some key investigations and some key results in that which aren't looked at. So if we file things electronically, we know that everything was going to be filed because we can develop work lists on ICE to do that. So some dependencies that we need to put in place. We need to have a linkage from um, the admissions, discharges and transfers feed into ICE. That then tells 
make sure that we get the right clinician and the right, right location for each of the patients. So if they're coming into a ward, um, they're in that ward and they've got that consultant and that will pre-populate rather than at the moment it's drop down lists on ice. Um, we need to have our standard operating procedures in place and we need to have some improvements in our infrastructure. So we need an audit of hardware in each department that we're going into and turning off paper to make sure that there's enough computers in the right place. It might be that they don't need any more computers, the, the computers just need to be in a different place. And we need a little bit of organisational IT resilience. We're about to move all the, the main servers for the organisation off-site um, to off-site hosting for safety reasons. And that will give us a little bit more resilience. Um, at the moment, they're underneath the kitchens. So if there was a fire in the kitchen, we would lose lots of stuff. What does it mean for staff? It's going to mean cultural change. For the clinical staff, they're going to have to get used to standard operating procedures. Um, there's going to be a greater reliance on IT. You're going to have to sit down and log onto your computer each day and make sure, or a cu each couple of days to make sure you've got results. Uh, you've looked at your results. I can't imagine working as a doctor without using a computer now, so um, for me that would be fine, but for some they don't use their computers as much. There's no push by having results sent to a desk, so there's no sort of physical you can't see your desk because of the results on the desk. There's not that physical sort of push to, to do that. For the non-clinical st staff there's going to be freed up time for other tasks to be done. And there may be changes to the role of some of the, the staff um, and they may support us in different ways. We're going to try and ensure quality by looking at um, embedding click view dashboards to look at how many, how many of the results are signed off in each department. We're key that we need to make sure that we do sign stuff off so we can't have departments just ignoring the sign off altogether. And we feel that should become part of the quality and clinical governance of a department. And we're going to provide training and support for implementation. For the FY starting this year, it's going to be part of their standard training. That filing is how it's done. Um, and there'll be a specific electronic Learn Pro module for those staff who um, need help with how to file. So the rollout plan is that we're going to um, look at going to different departments or directorates at a time. So looking at capacity and flow. So we're going to move to specialist services first, lots of discrete small specialties, and work with them to turn off paper um, for their results. Um, there'll be a project board and a sort of a, a group implementation group driven by the department and the directorate of that. So we're not going to go in and say, we're going to do it all for you and then step back. We're going to expect the directorates to take an active part in the process of turning off paper. Um, and we're going to look at that sort of schema where we we meet and I've already met with specialist services where we're going first and then we're going to start the, the hardware risk review we'll do the training and then we go live and once we go live we're going to support the department for several weeks until they're up and running fully we understand that some departments will work very quickly and move very quickly others might take a little bit more time so it all depends on which directorate you're in um, when we get to you because we're going to try and do it rather than saying we've got 12 weeks to crack it we're going to take as long as it takes to crack it and then move on to the next directorate and crack that directorate. Because there's no point doing a, a bad job in one place and then moving on and doing a bad job in a second place. So it's going to take as long as it takes, but hopefully as we move through the organisation it will get quicker. So that was easy. What's to come in the future? This is the NHS 2020 vision, uh, NHS Tayside 2020 vision, um, and it's a rich picture which sort of has lots of themes in it from integrated care um, and looking at health at home with the home and the person in the centre. This goes back to health and social care integration with specialist services and direct access diagnostics and things. So I'm just going to focus on a few small areas and say a few things. So in terms of specialist care, we're going to move to a new patient administration system which has a strong inbuilt EPR functionality with it. Um, Track Care is a nationally procured patient management system. It has good inbuilt EPR functionality and it increases each time there's a new edition. Um, some areas of Scotland are using 2010 edition, um, other areas are using 2012. We'd be looking at implementing 2014 or 15 edition, so it'll have significantly more functionality than the editions which have gone before. It's utilised to different levels across different areas of Scotland. NHS Lovian have uh, a long relationship with track care and have a very advanced version of their uh, track care system. Glasgow are using it as a patient management system and have taken a route of using a portal instead for their electronic patient record. 
it's got it's not a small company it's got a, a huge market presence worldwide in terms of global sales it was the largest EPR provider in 2013 across the world it's in the top three for functionality and innovation in a, cup, in a report by a company called Gartner, which is like a, a, a market um, survey um, for EPRs. They also do all sorts of other IT systems as well. And in the US, it's fully um, certified by Medicare and Medicaid as being a functional EPR. So it is a system with credentials. There you can see that there's two systems up here, Epic and CERN and Millennium, in the leaders and visionaries corner of the, the Gartner report and intersystems is third. You might ask why we haven't gone for Epic. Epic is not only Epic in its abilities, but it's Epic in its price. Um, it would cost us um, in so much money that we couldn't have, we'd make the NHS Tayside go bust. Um, and the other thing about Epic is you have to do it Epic's way. So they are very di didactic in saying, if we're going to come in and work with you as an organisation, you have to do what we tell you to do, rather than build the, a sort of a collegiate relationship and build the processes around you. And you can see that which vendors deliver ongoing value, InterSystems is, is top rank from that point of view. So it's a, it's a good product. It has lots of um, different parts. It's got a core um, PaaS foundation and a clinical information system foundation. So within that, you get a clinical EPR, results entry and communications, um, some care planning stuff, and um, this care provider workbench is to some extent a referral workbench. And then you've got the PaaS part of it there as well. And then you can purchase on top of that as add-ons, departmental and other systems. And um, you can see what's been used across Scotland in the different boards in future, it also has a prescribing module, which is undergoing testing across Scotland at the moment So, um, to make sure it's up to standards. There's only one um, accredited prescribing module in Scotland by a company called Jack. Um, TrackCare are looking to get there. They've got some work still to do, but they're in the process of... They've had a, a run-through of the system, and it's gone back to be re-evaluated. So what will Track give us in the first instant? Um, it will give us um, the ability to change from ED Symphony. So ED uses its own PaaS system. So they're totally separate to the rest of us at the moment. So we don't know what's going on. We don't know if patients come and go, come and go, when they come into the secondary, if they come into a ward. So we don't have a, 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 an integrated pathway. And at the moment, they're sitting on a different path. So when we're looking at moving patients across from one area of the hospital to another, um, they're totally separate. So it will give us that. It will replace Topaz our patient administration system. It will give us a new maternity system, um, which is desperately needed at the moment. And it will also give us EPR functionality. There might be the ability, after some gap analysis, to remove some of our single specialty systems. Not all of them, I say, as a renal physician. Um, but where there's, a, where there's the ability for the EPR to do the work which is being done in that single specialty system, we will try and remove that single specialty system. Um, and that will be after consultation and looking at what the current system does and what the track could do for you instead. In time, um, it will give us electronic prescribing, we hope. And with some work from IT, we're hoping it will link well to Portal. So you'll be able to access track and then get a contextual link to Portal and back again. So how did we evaluate track? Uh, we went to other sites which used track. Um, NHS Grampian's done a good job of uh, implementing TRAC. Uh, they don't have a portal, but they've built a portal into TRAC. Um, so they've um, done a good job of that. There's a hospital called San Torso in um, northern Italy, which is nearly paper-free using TRAC. Unfortunately, I didn't get to go on that visit because I had childcare problems. Um, but a team went out there and saw how um, you could nearly work paper-free with TRAC. NHS Lovian, as I said, have got a long history with track and have their own license. So it's a slightly different product, but it shows that it can be done. And the, the team from the patient administration side and, and business reporting have been down to Greater Glasgow and Clyde to look at um, reporting. The other thing that Cliff and I have done is we've built some inpatient scenarios um, where patients come in to discharge, and we've looked at how you document that information on their electronic patient record to see if it's got the functionality. So where are we with it? The, the business case and direction has been approved by the board. Um, the project's still in initiation phase. 
There's a business project directors to be appointed, so there's implementation money to go with it. It's not just a question of putting the product in. There's a significant amount of money for hardware and there's a significant amount of money for the project management of, of putting the system in place. We need to get clinical engagement. So this is where I'm saying we need clinicians to come along and actually be involved. I can go to lots of meetings, but I only represent one part of the clinical um, body. I need to have colleagues to come along and say, well, that's actually not right, and, or it would be better to do it this way. So we need clinician engagement. engagement. The other thing that we're doing is we're actually starting to plan. Um, other boards have moved from Topaz to Track, so there's discussion about how we migrate our PAS across. We're, there's discussion about business reporting because obviously uh, we can't just um, move the PAS across and not have the business reporting for Scottish Government to go with that. So there's um, the business units started to look at that. And the other thing we're doing is we're trying to consolidate our paper. There, are, You might have noticed there's a new fluid balance chart come out which is replacing about seven different fluid balance charts across the organisation. Um, in some departments they might have ten different forms which do the same thing. So we're trying to look at how we reduce our number of documents so we have a core set of referral documents and management documents we can then use those core documents to build um, forms within track to give us the functionality that we need but there's no point doing that in track until we've got the information right on paper because otherwise we'll spend a lot of time redeveloping and redeveloping and that will take significant resource so Vicky Hansen and Sue Mackey who are two of the senior nurses along with an e-health nurse are actually going around collecting all the bits of paper they can find in the organisation and categorising it with a view to how we can work with departments to, to streamline their documentation. So the proposed model of clinical engagement is that we want clinical representation on each and every project board and team. Um, we need, we're going to communicate via existing clinical and professional infrastructures, such as this, um, but also all the governance groups and leadership groups and we're going to have specific sessions for track as we start the, the rollout. And we're hoping to have representation on system design workshops for if we're replacing paper with forms, we want the, the team who are going to use those forms to be involved with that process rather than being told that this is the set of forms that they're going to get. If we think about integrated pathways of care between primary care and secondary care, I think our portal because it's GPs have access to clinical portal, which doesn't happen in every part of Scotland. The, you know, in Aberdeen, they've built their portal into track, um, but the GPs don't have access to track, so they don't have access to all that rich in information which is available in portal. Even down to having to, you know, that feed from Topaz to say someone's got an appointment at the cardiology clinic on 2nd of August at 2 o'clock, they can see that in portal. So if the patient doesn't know and they're in seeing or the GP wants to know that information that's there, um, we need to link our specialty systems to an integrated patient view, so we need to pull more of the information from our single specialty systems in. And with TRAC, we believe that clinical portal and TRAC will be the core of the secondary care electronic patient record. How about a person-centred approach to care at home, or as close to home as possible? We have a system called MIDAS at the moment, um, which is a multidisciplinary... Lynn, help me with the other half of... Information system. Um, and... It's, it was built by NHS Tayside for a consortium because there was nothing available at the time it was built. It's now reaching the end of life. It's um, got performance issues and we're going to replace it with a system called EMIS Web which has been implemented across Great, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. It has um, ability to be used by district nurses, community midwifery, child health services and mental health. It will help them do things like you know, something as simple as managing um, detention orders under the Scottish Mental Health Act. Um, the clinicians spend a significant amount of time worrying about getting the forms in on time and stuff, while my um, EMIS will help them do all that and set alarms for when people need replacement forms done. Um, so that's what we're planning to do for a MIDAS replacement. In terms of how we integrate care with third sectors and with local authorities... There's a system called Strata, which we've bought and we're starting to develop, which aims to improve that link between health and social care. And it'll be a portal for referral between health and social care. And we've got this running in Perth and Kinross as a trial at the moment, whereby all the community referrals from the secondary care environment are put into Strata. And then the clinicians working in primary and um, community care, so OTs and 
a physios working in the community, but also a social worker picking up those referrals from Strata rather than, and then updating Strata so that we can see that two-way flow of information. There's ongoing discussions with Dundee and Angus councils. There's some infrastructure work which needs to be done to, to get the systems to talk. How about um, one of the other goals of the um, NHS Tayside 2020 vision, which is maximising the opportunity through innovation and technology in support of health and healthcare service delivery? That really means research, evidence, and outcomes. Um, so, for those of you who haven't heard of it, the Academic Health Science Partnership has recently uh, got underway in Tayside, and part of one of the themes of that is informatics and how we can work between the university and the NHS to improve our um, informatic goals. Um, but to do that, we need to improve the quality of the data that we have. So we, as an organisation at NHS Tayside, we need good quality data, clinical data. We have good organisational data on um, waiting lists and um, bed capacity, bed, um, bed occupancy and things like that. But we don't have evidence easily extractable without going into Excel spreadsheets or individual clinician audit for how well we do from various cancers or um, how the dialysis patients do, whatever. So we need to get more data in a structured format which we can then analyse. There's real-time organisational data that we need, capacity and flow. There's nurses on a red alert weekend walking around this hospital looking for empty beds all the time. When actually, if the whiteboards were implemented fully and people were updating them, they could sit and actually just spend that time managing the, the flow of patients rather than trying to identify physically the beds. There's waiting list management issues. Public health would like to have more disease trends in real time rather than waiting for the SMR data to come back from the Scottish Government because that might take three, four months. And it will help with service design. If you're a gastroenterologist and you want to know how many people you've got who've got hepatitis C who might benefit from that really expensive new cocktail of treatment, you need to do a case note audit at the moment because there's no coded way of finding out the, the hep C population unless they're coming to the hep C clinic. So being able to design and um, look at how you organise a service is important. So the data needs to be structured so it can be interrogated easily, be that in in a standard coding system, so OPCS4, ICD10, that should be, or SNOMED. Uh, and we need to be able to link that to research and business analytics. The organisations bought a dashboard called ClickView, which is a really good, powerful tool, but it needs to have the data to analyse. Like any um, data analysis tool, rubbish in, rubbish out. So we've got to get good data in, and then we get good data out. And it needs to be extractable for research, the more information that we can extract for research for the university, um, the more that we can work together with them to look at how we can improve, we can use the university's expertise to develop quality improvement and um, work across that sort of divide. This is our dashboard in Reno. We've got an electronic patient record and we've developed a dashboard and this is our, our prevalence data for what we've got in terms of dialysis patients at the moment. Uh, and that data is updated each day. So if you've got an electronic patient record which can provide data, you can get data out very easily. So this is the four parts of it. We've got track for secondary care, strata for social care, EMIS web for the community health and Portal as our secondary primary interface. And that's our strategy for the next 10 years for our electronic patient record and how we're going to change informatics in Tayside. Just in terms of a couple of quick current developments, we've got an outpatient communication script, which has just come online. And from the beginning of August, the plan is that as much as possible, we will be using that to communicate to GPs rather than the paper flimsies. Um, basically, it's a pre-filled form, which you... Um, just have to put in a provisional diagnosis, um, some comments and recommendations, and then the medication that you're recommending, and then you press the submit button and it goes off to general practice via uh, an electronic transfer. So it goes into the GP's work, work stream automatically. So it's a very quick, simple, it doesn't take it any longer than trying to peel two stickies out the back of the case notes and then write the form for the GP and then you've got to hand it to the patient and tell the patient to take it to the general practitioner. So it doesn't take any more time and it is working really well and there's been lots of positive feedback from clinicians and also from general practice about it. The whiteboards, I'll skip for benefit of time, but they, everyone's seen them up and running. Um, there's moves to get them more um, clinically based, so having more information on which is clinical and less information which is just about capacity and flow, so such as um, having a 
at risk of deterioration column so that at night, hospital at night can come onto a ward and see which patients are sick and which patients are well just by, the, by looking down the board. Things like that which are very simple to um, potentially achieve are what we're focusing on with the whiteboards. So at that I will open you up for questions. Oh. Thank you very much. I think we can all remember trying to flick through the back of the case notes looking for an ECG when somebody came in with chest, some, pain. With chest pain saying, shall we streptokinase this person or not? Um, That's a long time ago, Stuart. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm 40. Uh, any questions for Drew? Please. Um, do we have a microphone? I'll shout, shall I? Because it's being recorded. But Shout. So, I'm hoping that the requirements of clinical researchers are being embedded very much in this rollout of the new world. So we, ha we haven't included, this is in the clinical acute setting, so areas such as the CRC, if we're doing requests via the CRC, they will not be included in this and they will continue to get paper at the moment. Um, so we've, we're moving across the acute specialties and it's all acute diagnostics it's not, um, and we can actually turn on paper, turn off paper by location. So if it's a um, CRC or, say, um, Professor McMurdo's um, research trial, a number 22, you can actually tur keep that location turned on so that the, the paper will come back to you. And you can also print it from ice. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't want people to print stuff from ice. Tom. Maybe, maybe I missed everything, but uh, I don't ever remember being offered training in any of the IT systems that have ever been rolled out. And as a result, uh, I always traveled a bit with them. I think that's a really key issue to train the consultants, not just the juniors. I think, I think you've hit the, you know, the, the nut on the head there. Um, training consultants is a lot more difficult than training juniors, um, <laughs> partially because of time restraints. Uh, constraints and also um, because um, we all think we are too busy to go to training um, and I, I honestly mean that you know there when I started here I, I got before you got when I started to write before you could get a nice password you had to go to training um, now the STs don't get an ice training unless they request it but there is training always available um, for clinicians um, to get training on any of these systems if they need it for all the FYs, we train as we go. So as part of the um, FY induction, they will get specific sessions on um, ICE, clinical portal, EDD, um, PACS, so that they are up to speed when they start. And we can retrospectively train anyone. And part of the rollout plan is to have trainers in each director. And that's why we can't do the organisation at once, is that we need to have trainers available to go in and train people who are not up to speed at the present time of using that system. I think we can thank Drew again. I'm looking forward to not using paper because nobody can read my handwriting. At this stage, Tom would usually tell you what's coming up next week, but 
Frankly, I have no idea. Neither do I. Um, so next week is a presentation by Professor MacDonald on the dangers of um, beta blockade. I don't know. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Well, this somehow we have to switch off.